let's get started with open source. So who, who here has contributed to open source before? Roughly 30%, awesome, that is great. Who wants to contribute to open source? All right, so we are done with the talk. I, <laughs> good, go, do it. All right, um, let me tell you a, a little story that happened, uh, I don't know, 14 years ago? It all started with a simple exception in Java. I was in my early career um, doing a training with customers on a specific framework. And one of the participants in the training, he encountered an exception and was asking me, like, Benny, what can I do? I, there's an exception, I don't know what to do. I'm like, what is the cause of the exception? I don't know. Okay, uh, let's click on the stack frame and figure it out. And he's like, I can't do that. It's not my code. And so this was his code. The other code that he called was from a framework that he didn't know and he would not click on that thing because these are internals. He is not allowed to touch that. He's not. There was a mental barrier between his code and the code he was consuming from third-party libraries. And that, that was the moment when it clicked for me and realized that my, in my past and the people I worked with, it was, it, it was normal to debug into other components that you don't own. For him, it was not clear. And that was like the, the start of actually that talk, like over 10 years ago, thinking about what makes open source open source and how does it actually change your mindset and how can it impact your career. Um, so I'm here today uh, as an open source enthusiast. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I'm working at GitHub on the Copilot project, in, in case you have, have seen that. And I am also Java champion, which we will come back to later how that happened. So overall, this whole talk is, is based on I wanted someone to write my biography, but nobody wanted to. So I will just take it from there and do it myself. So let's talk about me today. Um, the things I've, I've encountered on the way through open source, through my career so far, are fourfold. Uh, we have things that are about learning and doing fun things. Um, open source can be fun. It also has a dark side to it. Uh, we will get back to that. We want to create new opportunities through open source. We want to help your company to be successful. And we also, especially, we want you to be successful. And I was there and tried all of the things for you in open source and tried to distill it today for you. How can, how can those things actually influence you? How you can set yourself up for success, success? And there are actually like two interesting routes in open source. Uh, so this is you. And so there's the easy route. There's a paved path, there's actually a street to contribute to existing open source projects. It's relatively easy, but it might not be as fun. You just walk the street, all right. Um, it can be fun, depending on what kind of adventure you want to do. Like if you want to go to a city and like, meet all the other citizens, that's a great way of getting into open source. You can also choose the harder way and actually create your own open source project. You have to climb the mountains yourself. You might have a friend with you or not. Uh, it's actually better you don't fly solo, so take a friend with you. Uh, but it's a lot harder, but also like an amazing adventure if it, if it works. And so I've tried the different ways, and um, let's see what they, what they told me. So my very first own open source project was during school, um, I was like just hacking around, not doing anything particular. I was, uh, back in the days, I was working with PHP. Uh, who here remembers PHP or touched it? Okay, not so, no, oh yeah, thank you, almost all of you, great. <laughs> We're friends. So, oh, <laughs> you will have some flashbacks today, sorry. <laughs> so I, I, was, I was working with PHP doing kind of not really freelance things, but mostly on my own, um, exploring the space of, of programming. And there was this other technology I just found by accident, which was called XSDB. It was a database, but it was an XML database. Like you actually stored XML documents into it. And it was, it was called an XML database because no SQL wasn't coined yet. It, it was coined, but ne nobody knew it. Um, it was actually three years before Mongo even uh, was a thing. So why did I touch, that, touch XSDB? I don't know, there was no reason. I didn't need any XML database. It, was, it sounded like fun. So given I was familiar with PHP, I wanted to like, write 
and interact like a client to the database. And so that was my first project. Um, here's the project proposal. Uh, Peer is the PHP package manager for, for you don't know. Um, and it's not that you just publish a package there, you actually write a proposal for that package. And then there's like a committee that votes on your proposal. It actually took me a year to get the proposal and the project into a state that they accepted it to peer. Uh, it, used, it was an official peer package in the end. Uh, and it was, it was a huge success. Um, I had four downloads. <laughs> Three of them were from me. Um, just testing if the download works. Uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. So you, you're laughing, right? The, the metric you're, you're looking at is the number of downloads. For me, that was actually a successful project because I learned so many things. I learned how to write a proposal that is accepted by like senior PHP engineers at the time. Like I was pretty young, I had no clue what I'm doing there. Um, so they helped me shape that proposal, they helped me to shape that library. I learned with the discussions with those folks, what is an API, what's an API boundary, how do I define that? I learned about strategy patterns because um, ExistDB ex exposed the SOAP API and REST was just coming up and like, is REST a real thing? Should, should, we, should we move to that, to that new technology? Like, we don't know. So we, we actually supported both. And it was, it was a hell of a ride. And actually, at some point, I got, somebody sent this book to me saying, thank you for that library. I actually featured it in my book. Nobody bought that book, but that's a different, di different thing. I got featured in a book, my project. Awesome. Um, so, First thing I learned in open source is there are so many things that can go wrong and that you think are not successful, but at the end of the day, success is defined by what you learn from it, what you draw out of it, be it motivation, be it fun, be it um, learning something new. And open source has that environment and also has all the different people that help you to explore new things. So a lot of the stuff I learned there, I would have never discovered myself if I haven't done it for, for that project. And so um, along the way, during my years in, in open source and in others, I met a lot of very interesting people that I deeply admire, and I wanted to incorporate them here uh, with their lessons. So I actually interviewed, I think, eight people uh, in open source to see was it similar for them, the impact open source had on them? And so, for, exa for example, Alex here, she's a CEO um, at Predex. She is contributing to an open source project in the Eclipse ecosystem. And for her, it's like learning how a community can work together across boundaries, across companies. That was like eye-opening for her to learn how like in a larger community you can actually work together. So uh, I found it very interesting. So my first contribution to a large project, um, large in the sense of that was Eclipse. Who here has used Eclipse or is using Eclipse? Who is still using Eclipse? Ouch. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, so Eclipse is interesting. This was 2006, it was my first bug report at Eclipse. It was a time when I was still doing PHP, so I used Eclipse as a PHP IDE without PHP plugins because they didn't exist at that point, but everybody was talking about, Benny, you should use an IDE. Okay, here's an IDE. I used it as a text editor back in the day. Great. Um, I found a problem, I reported a bug, it was closed as invalid. That felt weird in a sense, but at the same time, I actually learned why it's invalid. The, like, the committers on the project explained w where my thinking got, got sideways and actually explained how correctly or how to correctly use it. And I actually learned something from that. And so over the years, um, I actually become, became a contributor and committer on a lot of, open, uh, a lot of Eclipse projects. Uh, in the end, I accumulated like almost a thousand defects and issues I created there. And today I want to focus on the first four there because I found them very interesting. It's also like history lesson of going back and seeing what happened back then and how did it actually influence uh, decisions later on. So if we look at those four defects, the first one we talked about, the second one uh, here 
it's in a part of Eclipse called Mylin, which was like an integrating issue trackers in your IDE. And I had a discussion there with a person named Robert Elves. And on the, on the ticket, I also had discussions with someone named Stefan Pingle and Mick Kirsten. Little did I know that my second bug report at Eclipse uh, actually turned into a nine-year career at the company they founded. So given our connection through open source, um, I actually joined that company very early on and uh, actually learned a lot during those times in that company uh, with a lot of open source people and a lot of, a lot of other awesome folks there. And it was, it was just interesting to see how those, how those interactions happen, because without that bug report and follow-up bug reports, I would have never known those people and actually get to know them over time. And so this is uh, one of them. He's uh, Stefan Pingle. Uh, he's now a principal engineer at Tastop. And for, he, for him, it's the same. Like He started contributing to that Mylan open source project, and through that was actually part of uh, founding that company and... Um, actually making Mylan a success over the years before they moved on to other things. The important thing to learn here is open source and contribu contributions are not about code. Code is one aspect, documentation is a different one, but even looking through issues, trying to reproduce them, that's a major contribution uh, to the code as well. Also when you go into interaction with the contributors and committers on the projects, you actually tend to learn quite a lot on that journey as well. Like if you, if you start creating issues for a framework that you use um, very soon, you will actually have more inside knowledge into how the framework works and how it interacts with the, with the rest of your stack than if you just are a user of, that, of the framework. So key lesson number two. My first code contribution to a large project. Um, so we, we, we talked about issues, now we talk about code. Uh, coming back to our first issues, issue number four um, was annoying me so much in the Eclipse IDE that I started saying, okay, I'll try and fix that. N no idea what I was doing there, but let's get started. Uh, by the way, so if you saw it, so extension point enhancement, that summary was shit. So lesson number two and a half, write proper bug reports, this is not your bug report, that's just harassing people. <laughs> Be nice to open source people. Talking about this. Um, I went on a journey to, like, the fix sounded trivial, because when I opened the feature request, the committer said, hey, this is kind of easy to fix. <laughs> that's what they all say. Uh, it's easy to fix here a few places where you have, can look at and um, that you can start maybe contributing. So I took that as an advice and went for it. It took me right two or three days to set up like the repository it was still CVS, so actually it wasn't cloning, it was checking out and uh, building the whole thing. There was no real build script. So it was, it was fun, um, which actually, uh, while I was preparing the talk, Alan, Don uh, Alan Donovan, who is part of the Google Go team, he, he mentioned that actually the, <laughs> the immutable law, the hardest part of any first-time contribution to an open source project is figuring out how to build and run the tests. And if you get that right, you actually get a lot more contributors. If you see that it's hard, help the maintainers make it easier. That's another way to contribute. Uh, so going back to my enhancement, uh, it's pretty funny because this was my, this was my first contribution. Um, in these three lines, I had actually three problems. Um, what people didn't know at the time, this was my first line of Java. I actually had to Google index off because I didn't know how that works in Java. Um, fast forward, that led me down the Java path, which um, I'm now a Java champion a couple of years later. So getting that feedback on that patch actually helped me to improve uh, with my Java knowledge. There's still a bug in there, but they haven't found it yet. I just checked it out yesterday, so it's still in there. Uh, but it works roughly. It, it does what it's intended to do. And one of the people working on that project who also interacted with me quite a lot during that time is Chris. Uh, so Chris is, in the meantime, the CTO of the CNCF. So he went the whole open source way. And he was one of the main people 
that were available to talk to others, to welcome new contributors, to help them find their way, to help getting patches through. And for him, it was, it was pretty similar. He actually started an internship contributing to open source, which led him into getting a job at IBM at the time, helping others into open source and um, continuing that. So it, it was quite inspiring to also see where, where Chris is heading with his open source story. So an important thing to notice there is work on the things that interest you. The only reason I pushed through all of that was because I was using something daily and it, it made my, heart, my life hard every day. So I decided to fix that and it was actually, that helped me quite a lot. So work on the things that interest you. Uh, that, that is a key motivator to, don't do open source for the open source reason, but to actually um, have fun with it. And it's actually funny, so here is uh, an excerpt of me contributing to the eGit project, which was the Eclipse plugin for Git in 2010. And the fun part is I never wanted to touch that project. But given I, w I, I loved Git and I wanted to use Eclipse all day long, I had to do it. And funny enough, um, some of the people who reviewed me there, who, who were doing that in their free time, I lost contact with them. I actually looked them up the other day. They're most of them working at GitHub these days. It was a pretty funny coincidence. So, um, exactly. That's what you're thinking right now. It's all fun and games, Benny, but I got no time for this. Um, There's so many things I have to do daily in my job. There are kids at home, and I get that. Um, I have two, two boys at home, and it, it's a good representation there. And honestly, they are more important than open source, hands down. But there are still ways to make that work. So one is approaching open source from the company perspective. So I just assume for this talk that your software that you build depends on open source in some way or the other. I see nodding, yes. That's, so, that's a fact that most management also knows about these days. That's great. What they don't know is what the costs are of depending on certain projects and depending on the problems they bring with them, be it security vulnerabilities, be it workarounds you put in your code to work around things that are not fixed upstream. And so this is another example how, for example, you can do open source contributions as part of your day-to-day -day job with the frameworks and tools you use day-to-day. -to -day. So I used to work in a company, they, like, they actually copied multiple classes around in different projects to work around a specific issue in a project. Uh, and when I, when I saw it, it's like, okay, what's the problem? And nobody knew, and nobody, nobody really investigated what the root cause was. Uh, turns out, it was a one-line change and six lines of tests in the open source project to delete all the workarounds in the code base of the company. And sometimes you just have to dig into the third-party dependency. And worst case is, you learn something new. So this is Mark. Um, he's a senior principal engineer at the Gradle uh, company. Um, he's also the lead of JUnit 5. I used to work him during my time at Gradle. And his open source story it started actually that way. So his first contribution in open source was to JUnit 4 contributing a version bump of a dependency and making the tests pass because his company required a new version and JUnit was blocking that. So he went out, he did that. Uh, he wanted someone to cut a new release and they were like, we don't have anyone who can build this thing. So he took it on and he built JUnit 4 at that time and uh, over time he actually became the, the lead of JUnit 5, uh, set up the whole infrastructure for JUnit 5 and it, it, it's another awesome story how little contributions can actually help you to, to reach, those, reach those goals. Which also is something that is really interesting when it comes to your own career um, by making things visible. So as an example, a company I worked for for like nine years, I learned tons of stuff in that company. Uh, we were growing from a startup to a larger company. Uh, we had so many teams, we had so many awesome engineers working on so many awesome tools and, and frameworks. But at the end of the day, it's, it was really hard to communicate that to like the next company I applied for because it was all internal. 
And so it was interesting how easy it is to talk about my open source contributions in that light. So when I was applying at, for example, Gradle or GitHub, uh, one, of the, one of the main things we talked about were open source contributions I did in the past because these are open, these are visible. Uh, the blog posts I wrote in public, the open source contributions I did, these are the things that, that help you to, to actually, um, yeah, talk about those things and, and can showcase your work. And it's also fun as well. All right. Another aspect of open source is gaining knowledge. We talked a little bit about that in the beginning, um, but let me give you another example. An obvious and not so obvious example. So this is the search dialog in Eclipse. Um, and by the way, don't feel sorry, I don't use Eclipse anymore. Uh, this is the search dialog in Eclipse. It's, it has a lot of things going on in there, uh, but essentially it's a search. And so it was so frustrating because it always did the wrong thing. It, it always felt like it was doing the wrong thing. When you open the dialog, it was on the wrong page or selecting the wrong buttons. And at some point I set out and I was like, I'm, I'm going to fix that today. So I dug into the code and um, realized that the things I wanted to contribute, and the things I wanted to fix, they're already fixed. It's a feature. It's a customized button down below. I was like, oh, that's embarrassing. Okay, I learned something. Cool. Talked to a coworker the other day and like, hey, see what I discovered. He's like, wow, I was looking for that thing for years. Like, this dialogue is driving me crazy. Okay, coincidence. A few months later, we actually did a, a talk internally to our company talking about best practices and how to use IDEs effectively. And we, this was one of the tips we shared. 20 people showed up after the talk thanking us for discovering this button. And it's like looking back at it and showing it here, it's like it's obvious there is a customized button, but it's actually interesting how little you sometimes see in the day-to-day -to -day tools you use. There's also some hidden Easter eggs in Eclipse, like you can click certain buttons while holding control to change behavior. It's never documented. You can only see it in the code. All right. Uh, looking into the code may reveal some of its secrets. It's sometimes obvious that it will reveal secrets, sometimes it's not so obvious. Um, go and start looking around for even the obvious things. So for example, there are like thousands of libraries out there, be it Apache Commons or Guava, who implement factorials. You pass in a number, you get back to factorial. Great. Um, most people would just use like, either a loop or a recursion to solve the problem. Not Guava. Guava actually implements this differently. Like why? Why would you do that? Simple. A, it's constant. The compi compiler can actually inline it. B, you don't need more than 20 because then you run your overflow long. It doesn't matter anymore. You never need to compute anything larger than the factorial of 20. It doesn't look nice, but it's fast. Another thing I learned on the day when I looked up how Guava implements Factorial. I was, I was happy. If you can't figure things out in your open source projects that you use, ask the maintainers. Usually main, maintainers, if you ask them nicely, they will go at great length answering you and helping you to be su successful. Uh, same goes the other way around. If you have problems with the library, if you see bugs, try to write, write proper reports, steps to reproduce, um, help them to, for example, reproduce existing bugs, and not just ask on the issues, when is this done, this is open for four years. Um, that's important, never ask that question. Another thing is helping out on the community side of things, uh, be it forums, Gitter, Slack, whatever the project offers. Try to help there or at least hang around because usually there's knowledge transfer happening all the time. When I use Framework X, I usually join one of their social channels to like, have some background noise of things that happen in that project. And to, like, because I, I constantly learn things about that project and how other people are using it, what are common problems, and maybe they actually help me to better use the framework. And one of the folks I met there was uh, David. So David is a principal engineer at Heroku. I met him 10 years ago in the Smarty forums. Who remembers Smarty, the PHP template engine? Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. 
there's one. So we were both like answering or helping people to use the template engine. And he actually founded uh, a PHP framework after that called Gavi and helped me contribute to that as well and actually paired up with me quite a lot. And I learned so many things about patterns, about solid designs, about test room development from him back in the days, uh, just because we had similar interests. And uh, it, it was great to have that connection back in the days. And so this also goes back to just exploring code bases. Uh, this is just an example of a visualization for a code base. There are like thousands of projects out there how to visualize and navigate a code base. But this is another thing. Get familiar with the unfamiliar. Get familiar with a different code base. Just poke around there. Um, go in there, see how, they, how do they use the frameworks you use, how they do testing differently maybe than you do. As I said, the worst thing that can happen is you learn something. And sometimes there's an obvious bug that you can actually help them fix. Depending on how the open source project is set up, it's actually easy or hard to contribute. Nowadays, whole, like a lot of projects have proper build systems, they have maybe actions to run things on. Um, an interesting and funny thing to do is on any GitHub repository, you can actually press dot, and it will open up like a full-blown VS Code for you to, to navigate around. If that's easier for you than navigating the websites, I found that really useful when trying to like get into a project and without cloning and doing everything first locally, you can actually do it that way. Uh, same for code spaces. But I will not go into GitHub things today. So look into the code, uh, change it. That's another thing. If you're scared of a code base, if it's a good open source project, it, it might have a lot of tests. Actually go in there, change something, let's see what happens, run the tests. Um, the good thing is nobody sees you even if you completely got it wrong, sorry, the wording. Uh, <laughs> if, if you got it wrong and the tests fail, okay. And if you can't figure it out, it's okay. Don't show anyone. It, you just still learn something from that. And this is, for example, one thing that I, I learned over time is getting to know another project, even from the outside, is so helpful to shape my ideas and how to use certain things. How do they use this build system? How do they use this new uh, framework? How do they use, how, why are their tests so fast compared to mine? Uh, what are they doing differently? And there's always something new that, that you learn. Another great thing is ask you five why. If you're not sure why something is happening, ask why five times. Why is that thing so slow? Okay, because it's calling this method. Why is it calling this method? Why is that method so slow? And go down that, that route. Um, it reveals interesting things. Um, my four-year-old has perfected that, that profession. Uh, <laughs> but it, there's actually, there's more to that. <laughs> it, it's actually funny how people give up when they grow up. Like, they grow up and stop asking why. You should actually do ask why. Um, and so th this is uh, another great example. So Flat here, I'm not sure if you're familiar, he is a database expert. He's writing books and uh, is the CEO of Hyperpersistence. Um, he is very deep into Java and, and databases. And so for him, it's the same. He looks at a library and he wants to understand how do they solve their problems. And he actually goes in there, tries to understand. That's how he started contributing to Hibernate. And that's how he started doing other things around Hibernate. So going in there often, often helps you to, to understand different things that you might even, yeah, you might even apply to your own projects. So key lesson number five, get your hands dirty. Worst thing that can, that can happen is you learn something new. Now we talk about data. We have this nice graph that just goes up. It can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the axis. Uh, hopefully, it's our stock value, but let's see. Uh, <laughs> running an open source project means people who use it have ideas how to evolve it. They have ideas which features to add, what behavior to change, and that's all good in games. If you are more, more successful, there are more people with ideas how to evolve the project and which features to add. 
and there are even more people with different interests doing the same thing. And you actually end up in a state that there are not only too many requests, but also contradicting requests. Because if you push that way, you can't push that way at the same time. And so, um, oh, you can't see that. This is the Gradle logo. Um, so I used to work at Gradle. And at Gradle, we had exactly that problem. So the Gradle project, uh, this, this chart is actually the number of open issues over time. Uh, so that's bug reports and feature requests. And for the team, the team consisted of six people at the time. Two and a half thousand issues is too much. Um, not talking about solving all those issues, even managing all those issues is insane. And so we worked hard to actually get that into a state where we could figure out what is reasonable, what is important, because that's the great thing. There are a lot of interesting ideas, but it's maybe just an interesting idea. And if you don't have the bandwidth for it, um, it's still, it, it adds not noise, but it, it adds management overhead to your open source project. And so one thing we did is we started with a bot that uh, closed issues after an inactivity of two years. That actually got us down a little bit. And we also had a lot of people very pissed at us. And so we tried to explain again, it's not that your request is invalid. It's not that this isn't a cool idea. It's just stale. It means no engineer working on the project had the capacity to look into that, and also no contributor. And so just to reduce the overhead of maintaining all those things, we have to close them. It doesn't mean we never do that. It might be that we reopen them in two weeks' time. But for now, uh, we have to make that project manageable. So this is also something next time when you see a, a stale bot closing your issue, think about, like, is it really unfair or is it actually helping the open source project? Because with that approach, what we found is that we closed like a thousand issues by the end of the day. Um, I think a hundred got reopened as this bug is still valid. All right, now we have a hundred things. That's something we can work with. That's something we can actually take on. Uh, so we, we actually reduce the noise and increase the signal. So that's also something you can help in open source projects. Go in there see if you can reproduce certain defects and help the maintainers to see what's, like, what is the signal compared to the noise. Um, if you look at other projects, VS Code, for example, has a pretty similar issue. Um, their baseline is at like five and a half thousand open issues. So asking when you get that bug fixed doesn't help with that. It's a massive effort to even maintain such a, I don't want to call it backlog, sorry such a list of issues, and uh, it's, it's awesome if the community can actually help see what is important, what can be closed. So maintainers, are the, they're super happy if you can actually close things off as this is not reproducible. And that brings me to Ben here. He is uh, working together with Eric Gamma uh, on the VS Code core. And I met Ben also back in the Eclipse days when he was working on RSSO, which was his like RSS reader based on Eclipse. And he said the, the reason why he stayed in open source and why he loved it is that so many other people actually from the outside contributed to his project and helped him to make it successful, to help him triage issues and do things. So how can you help projects? reproduce the reported defects, help triaging issues, help them actually get it into a shape before it even happens. For example, contribute a, an issue template uh, because everybody is missing the operating system and it's actually important for their project. Create an issue template for them, help them to use the features of the platforms they use. And so this is actually an interesting story from someone I met just recently, uh, who's, it's Lila. She's working as a product security engineer at GitHub. And she was actually working in a different field a couple of years ago and broke into tech by contributing back to open source. So she was learning programming with the Odin project. And as part of learning that, she actually contributed back to that learning platform uh, and contributed back not like non-code contributions, uh, which was her way of, of giving back in that case. And so with that, she actually broke into a tech career 
Um, I found that story really inspiring when, when she told me that. So, key lesson number six, help maintainers by creating space for their own contributions. The larger the project, the less the actual maintainers have time to work on the interesting bits because they're busy managing all the things around it. And it's actually those things that are very easy to actually help them out with. So, let's talk about sponsoring. There's not much to say there. Um, you can sponsor people in open source. That's great. Um, lots of folks use things like um, buy me a cup of coffee or GitHub sponsors or whatnot. Uh, there's one program I want to call out. If you're an open source maintainer, uh, this program is awesome. It's called Google Summer of Code. It's a program uh, initiated by Google and it's for essentially a summer internship. So young people can apply there to work on open source for three months on specific projects that the open source projects themselves set up. And they actually get paid, like the students get paid by Google to do so. It's, it's an awesome program. I've participated uh, in that during university years and I can highly recommend it. Uh, same as Patience. So she is a senior engineer at Octopus Energy and uh, she also did Google Summer of Code and she's still like, even, even years later, she's still in contact with her mentor back then because you have a mentee, like a young person, you have a mentor from the open source project while Google's paying for the whole thing. And she said, like this, like, this connection, not only the program itself, but this connection to her mentor enabled her so many other things uh, later in her career. There's another thing that sounds very similar to sponsoring, but is actually very different, uh, which is sponsorship. And sponsorship is the idea of using your connections and your knowledge to help others uh, raise in, in this industry. And so I would like to, you should take a photo of this URL. Um, this is actually a really interesting article about talking about mentorship and sponsorship. So mentorship is, hey, have you considered going to a conference and give a talk? Where sponsorship is, hey, I do know someone on that conference. Uh, I've recommended you. How about that? They can still say no but it's, the, it's actively helping others using your connections to do things like that. And so I, a great example for that is um, this book. So 90, 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Who, who has read that or who, who owns it? A few people here. So this was actually like, it's, it's a compilation of 97 things but different people contributing to the same book and so Trisha and Kevin, who will be speaking later on the stage, um, they actually contacted different people to get like a diverse set of, of things to, to contribute to that book. And I found it, it came out pretty, pretty awesome. It's, it has so many diverse and different points, and it's, it's really nice. And this is thanks to their sponsorship by actually getting, like recommending people to do certain, certain articles in there. And going back to open source, there's another story about sponsorship that um, shaped my career quite significantly, and I, I would like to share that. It was 2010 when I was just doing university things. I think I was just, it was even before university. And so I was hanging around in the Eclipse IRC channels doing things I shouldn't do and talking to people, and you've met some of them today. And then there was this huge event happening. It, it was called EclipseCon. It was like the Eclipse conference. And so the interesting thing is like that conference was super expensive and it was in California. Okay, sad. I would love to do something like that in my life. And there was someone named Philippe Ombredan and he was in good contact with the conference organizers. And he actually managed to tell them Benny will be our official IRC reporter for the conference. And he gets into the conference for free. And that was actually, he was, that was his sponsorship for me to get into the conference. I paid for everything else my, on my own, but I, I didn't need to pay for the conference. And that was actually my first conference I ever attended. Um, in the meantime, I got, I think, 50 talks on stage. So his move there, 
quite significantly changed the trajectory of my life and my career. And I found that like one of the core things, how to do a sponsorship. And I still remember the Santa Clara Convention Center there. It was good times. All right, number seven, promote your favorite open source projects, pay it forward. If you have open source projects, talk about them. Actually go on stage, talk about your favorite open source projects. Um, before the pandemic, my last talk on stage was about test containers, which is a project I love. It, it's like awesome. Two years later, um, actually seeing that success story of like, they founded a company around it, they have a lot of people working on it, uh, more and more people using it. So it's, it's actually great to, to see that these projects evolve, maybe not even as open source projects, but even as, as whole companies. So the key takeaways that we have today is leverage open source as a learning environment. Go there, learn something, fail, learn something from it. Make your work visible. The, right now, the market is very interesting uh, when it comes to people moving around. There are a lot of people looking for jobs right now, and open, like open source contributions are a key differentiator. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was interviewing with with a company like many, many years ago. And they were asking like, they, I think they missed my CV. I think the, the person interviewing me hasn't read my CV. He was like, do you, do you know Eclipse? It's like, yeah, I'm actually a committer on the Java tooling you use day in, day out. It was actually a pretty fun conversation after that. Uh, get your hands dirty. Go in those projects, see what they do. Touch it, break it see what, what comes out of that, and pay it forward. If you know something about open source or a project, tell others about it. Help the maintainers promoting the project in different ways, be it Twitter, be it talks. By the way, talks is another great thing to give back to, to the community and make your work visible. That's it from my side. Um, if you have questions, this is my Twitter account, you can always direct message me. If you want to break into open source, don't know why, message me. Um, if you have any other questions, message me. I thank you all for your time. I hope I could inspire the one or the other of you to maybe contribute to open source today. If not, message me. <laughs> and I will leave it with that. Thank you so much. And we have time for questions as well. Yes. I, th I think there's a microphone somewhere. Thank you, sir. Vielen Dank, Benjamin. I have a Frage. That's all my German. It's like you heard. So you started with your first commit, which was something simple, and also this lady, this superstar who started with readme files, fixing them. Mm -hmm. I once fixed Java myself, like there was some old version and the API had a typo there. So I just sent email to Oracle and they fixed it. <laughs> so my question is, how did you find something uh, that easy to fix? Because you said you didn't know Java this time. If, uh -huh. I, if I open your, uh, let's say, Gradle open source, yeah. all the tickets there, they're crazy difficult for me. Yeah, so how that, do you find that, easy ones? That, that's that is awesome. Um, that's an awesome question. So uh, all all those all those open source libraries and tools and they're like they're so large and complex and too meta for me to understand that. And I think and then if I go back to my first slides about the stack traces, that's the essential key. I think most libraries you use are actually way simpler than whatever commercial code you have there, because those are also Java programmers. And like, you can actually learn in both ways. Like I learned a lot in, my commer like in the commercial code bases I, I was working on and applied it to open source and also the other way around. It's just the perception that these frameworks or things are more complex. And sure, some of them are large and complex, but it doesn't mean that to, in order to fix a particular bug or contribute a feature that you have to understand the whole architecture. Because in your commercial code base, you don't do that as well. At least most people I know don't understand the whole code base, they understand parts of it. So I think it's important to uh, try and 
not think it in a way that this is all too complex and I'm not smart enough, but try it from an angle of, let's try this, let's learn something, because only that way you can get better and um, maybe learn something from it. It's, it's the same with um, a dependency injection framework. Like, should you build one? Yes, absolutely. Should you open source it and promote it? Nah, maybe not, we have enough of them. But actually do it once, see what the magic is all about, because once you build it once, you understand the basics of how to do a thing like that. Doesn't mean you, build, you, you can build a better one, but you understand some of the basic assumptions and problems doing something like that. That's my answer there. Hope that helps. Um, Whoa. <laughs> just a quick note on that. Um, a lot of maintainers have really been thinking about this too, right? So you can go and look on some like well-maintained repositories and quite literally there is a section on there that says great first uh, like PRs, right? So like easy ways to engage with the project. Yep. Um, I have a question for you, right? So in all of these languages, there is a different sort of contributor process into the ecosystem. Um, I'm sure that you're aware of sort of the pros and cons between them. Are, is there anything that you what? Uh, the pros and cons oh, of yep. these different parts. Yep. I'm interested, what do you think is sort of the best practice that you've seen out there for a like well-run ecosystem for your contributions? Is that a little too broad and vague? <laughs> I think the answer to that is impossible. Yeah. I think it heavily depends on the community around it and the people running it, because what works for one team doesn't necessarily work for another team. It heavily depends on, is that open source project solely run by uh, maintainers working during the night? Or is it, for example, with Gradle, is it actually run by a company where you actually have multiple people being paid to, to do open source software? And so very different things and very different incentives, very different priorities. So it's really hard to, to say there's, like, there's a best practice. And that's why, that's why I think I, my, my best recommendation is go talk to those people, understand how they want to run that project, how you can actually help, and try to adapt to that. And maybe that's another thing. Maybe you can actually learn about their processes. So for example, a lot of the things I applied in commercial teams, I learned from running open source projects and running teams in, in that context. So, I think there is no single answer. Sorry, but I have more questions. Sure. I can continue until tomorrow. I'm, all, I'm also around the whole day, so. Yeah, but I like asking questions in a way that it helps other people because I really, really like empowering others because I'm a very slow developer, but I, I'm good in helping others. Uh, brings more money to the company. So, in IT, there are many jobs, not only uh, not only software engineers. So, let's say if the data scientists come to me or test engineers come to me and they ask, "How do I find a project to contribute?" Even for me, it's difficult because a few weeks ago I tried to list open source projects which are interesting for me, interesting, so I can choose. And after I have like 20 columns and 25 projects, I'm like completely lost. And um, so how a data scientists find the project where she can contribute? Yeah, that great question. How, how to pick projects you want to contribute uh, goes back to the, what's your goal? Do you just want to randomly contribute to open source or do you want to have fun with it? If, we have, if you want to have fun with it, go to the projects that you use day in, day out because nothing makes you more proud than doing something in a project that you actually use day in, day out. Um, Eclipse open with in the context menu. I did that. Yay! Nobody knows, but I was proud. Every, every time I used I was super proud doing that. And there's like, one thing is contributing to, to open source is the right thing to do, but there's also that you have to motivate yourself somehow. And seeing those things being part of your day-to-day -day workflow is something that helps a lot to um, to actually continue doing that. Hope that helps. Cool. There's another question. Time's up. I don't know, can we take one more or not? 
in the in the front row there. Sorry. Well, uh, I don't have actually a question, but I have just have a small observation regarding Eclipse. I see that people usually don't like it, uh, and unfortunately in Java it's not so popular anymore. But in other t fields, I also do some microcontrol development. Everything is in Eclipse, right? Mm -hmm. NXP, STM, uh, Renesas, everybody's using Eclipse. So actually, did you know about the customize button? No, yes. no, I didn't know. <laughs> Got another one. So, <laughs> so actually, just yeah. Also, Eclipse is still alive. It's still uh, ticking. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely is yeah. alive. So yeah, that's my. Contribution. Thank you. You could. All right. Uh, just in case you have more questions, you can find me here. Um, there are GitHub stickers in case someone's interested. So I'll leave with, with that. Thank you so much.